of what they did before they joined Codemasters or formed Codemasters in David's uh, case. So uh, we're going to start with Bruce and uh, as befits these uh, presentations, I've got a, a photo of you from back in the day, this was in 1984 I think. Um, so. Bruce, you started, um, it's fair to say Bruce is one of the, if you like, a founding father of the gaming industry in Britain because he formed a company, or he, the Micro Digital was a, a company that you formed in, what, 1978? Yeah. Uh, well, you tell us about it. Um, what, what was the computing and gaming industry like at that, at that time? <laughs> wasn't <there. laughs> So, there was the beginning of hobbyist gaming in America what's called S100 machines using 8080 processors. And I was reading about this in Computing and Computer Weekly, and I thought, oh, I can do that. So we, with my brother, we set up this store in a book called MicroDigital. And we sold a kit computer called the NASCOM 1. And we sold huge amounts of books. And as the gaming took off, we were getting as home computing systems, Really gaming. As home computing took off, uh, the business grew and grew and grew, and we put a mail order side on and we were selling all over the world. And the lead came from America. America was where everything happened, and we were very much behind them. So, for commercial reasons, uh, I went to America a fair amount. And I used to go into the American computer stores and one day I was in one and I noticed there was a notice board and there was these things stuck on the notice board at Pothy and Banks. I said, what's going on there? And the guy said, well, they're, they're games. And I went over and inside each one was either a floppy disk uh, or a cassette and a piece of duplicated uh, instructions and, and people had home-written home them, home-duplicated them and then put them on a notice board to sell. And they're the first commercial home computer games that I ever saw. And I brought a whole pile of those back to England, and everybody went, wow! And we used them in the shop to, to demonstrate the, the machines. You know? so, so that's the first time that I saw games available for sale to the public. Really. Yeah. So that's the very dawn of the gaming industry in this country, you could say, definitely. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, so and from there you also actually started publishing a magazine as well, which is called the Liverpool Software Gazette. Um, what sort of made you want to, to start telling other people about the industry at that time? Was it purely a promotional tool for the store or was there more to it than that? No, there was more to it than that because everybody knew nothing except you know, just a small number of people. And so we sold huge amounts of books. We bought books from America and we sold literally tons of books, or physical tons of books. And the magazines then, tended to be things like Electronics Today International, which would have the Electronics Magazine and have just a bit about home computing in it. And because of our position in the store, we knew lots and lots of people who knew a lot, you know, people who worked at universities and so on. So we put together the magazine to try and disseminate that knowledge to a wider audience, which is exceedingly <coughs> good. And it was an attempt to do it seriously, you know, give serious knowledge about computing, to, to, to people who were taking it up as a hobby at home. And um, it was, a, it, was, it, was it worked, it was a good magazine. Okay, and you did actually sell Micro Digital to a large um, electronics retailer at the time, Lasky's was it? Yeah. And then, then you moved to um, work with Imagine Software. Now, well, we don't want to go into too much detail about Imagine because Bruce has done talks about them before and there's articles and it's, it's a very almost infamous history for that company. So we're just going to briefly touch on what you achieved with Imagine um, before moving on to other things as a result of that company's closure, if you don't mind. Okay, well, before Imagine, I worked as a consultant for a company called Bugbyte with the two Tony, Tony Bateman and Tony Milner. And they had employed some of my ex-staff from uh, MicroDigital. They had employed Mark Butler uh, as a salesman and they had employed Eugene Evans as a programmer. And so those guys said to uh, the two Tonys, you know, you want to get Bruce in. So I went and did a whole pile of stuff for them. And the thing that would probably be no most noticeable to you know, the buying public 
was that, that you, and you can see it's on the internet now, you can see their inlay cards were basically just photocopied, mono, hand-drawn, really tacky things. And I went and said, you know, you need to represent this with something like an album sleeve and have a four-color printed inlay card with an airbrushed picture that represents the game and so on. And you can see the switch in Bug Bite when, when, when that happened. Um, then Mark Buckler left uh, Bug Bite and one of their programmers, Mark Lawson, left at the same time to set up Imagine. And they asked me if I would come there and join them, which I did. And we had a very brief, uh, happy time, and uh, lots and lots of people, lots of what we did became kind of the foundations of the industry. Lots of people who we employed there went on and worked in other game companies. And uh, it was the very renaissance, you know, the beginning of, of the publishing industry in Britain, really, what we did. So, um, at the end of the year at uh, Imagine, uh, you are obviously a man who's uh, known for marketing. You had a particularly difficult marketing exercise, I think, and we'll just get these up on the screen. These uh, now infamous mega games, which was uh, probably the first ever example of vaporware, which is basically two games which supposedly were being produced by Imagine, but never actually, there was not never really any serious code or graphics produced for them, I don't think. Is that is that fair to say? Pretty much. Pretty much. So you were, you were sort of tasked with promoting these games in the press. Yeah. Um, how, how as, a, as a guy, obviously with marketing experience, how did you how did you sort of tackle that particular problem? Well, it was quite difficult because there was nothing there to market. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so each month I had to come up with another idea. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of the, the mega games was that was as an anti-piracy measure because we'd been hit by piracy. Our turnover just collapsed when Take to Take copying was discovered by the kids, and so we decided to stick a dongle on the back of the machine, a hardware dongle, so people couldn't play the game without the hardware dongle. That's all the mega games really were, it's just an anti-piracy measure. And the problem was that David Lawson had this thing that creative people shouldn't be managed, they should just left to create. And so Imagine always produced far less products than it could have because people had no management or discipline. They just made, did what they wanted to, did what they felt like. And so the guys who were on these games felt like doing nothing. <laughs> That's what happened. So, uh, and ultimately, as is well chronicled, uh, Imagine um, effectively went bust. The, the mega games never uh, materialised and uh, you obviously moved on to the, in the industry. Um, meanwhile, over in Canada, I believe, your career was starting, David. And uh, unfortunately, we've got a, a cheesy <laughs> picture from the 80s of you and your brother Richard, uh, and some pictures of some of the games that you produced prior to Codemasters. So, um, what, what sort of got you into sort of computers and, and coding in general? What, what made you become a bedroom coder? Um, well, my, my granddad uh, was an electronics engineer who works in Australia. He invented some of the first colour televisions and he worked in the Australian Navy for 25 years in the Morse Code room during, during the war and that kind of stuff. So he was like an electronics boyfriend. So he taught me how to build electrical counters and radios and all kinds of gadgets. Um, so I was really into electronics. And then when the computers came out at school in Canada, they had one computer in the classroom in the maths lessons that people could use. But there was only one keyboard, so we had to use like punch cards and do the code on with a pencil, just like making dots on the page, and then the punch card reader would read the code. Um, so it was quite laborious. So then I used to say to the teacher, "Can I stay after school like till 12 o'clock at night so I can use the keyboard? Because <laughs> there's only like, one keyboard that you could use." Um, so I couldn't learn how to program on the school computer. And then my friend heard that Commodore were launching um, the Commodore VIC-20. Actually, even before that, my, um, my dad bought a Commodore PEP for his business. He used to make uh, contact lenses. And when they were designing the contact lenses, they'd work out all the curvature of the lenses and things on paper using equations. Um, and he thought it would be easier doing it with a computer. 
So he bought a Commodore PET, and then he got me to work with programs to do these equations for the contact lenses. And I said I would do that as long as I could take the computer home at the weekends. And then um, do, I was really into Dungeons and Dragons, so we started doing some Dungeons and Dragons games. And then my friend bought this, he, went, he drove down to America to buy this Commodore VIC-20 and brought it back. And then me and my friend and my brother used to write games on the VIC-20. The first games you published, were they, did you actually publish any, or like sell any games in America, or was it not yeah. until you moved in? Well, we set up a com company called Dalbert Computing, because he, we were called Darling and he was called Heath, right. so it's like Dalbert Computers. But before we actually published anything, then my dad sent us back to England because um, he thought there was too much drugs in the schools <laughs> in Canada. Uh, so we couldn't, be, so that company like got dissolved. Yeah. Um, but then we'd already written quite a few games on the VIC-20 and then we carried on writing games and we sent them back and forth to Canada to England like in a competition how to make the games. And then we had a collection of games so we thought um, we'd just try and sell them. So we took out an advert in popular computing week half a page advert and my friend's dad was a graphic designer so he designed the ad for us. And uh, some of the, the two games down the left are from that was Galactic Software. Yeah. And the, those are two of the earliest games that uh, mm -hmm. David produced which are so got some quite interesting artwork on them. Yeah. <laughs> I drove to um, I I got six illustrations done and they were all like for six pounds for the, all of them. And when I went to collect them from the woman, she said I thought they were sixty pounds each. But <laughs> <laughs> I said I haven't got that much money. So, yeah. the deal with them. so uh, then, obviously, um, you, you become more established at coding. You started coding mainly for the Commodore sixty four. Yeah. Um, and um, your work attracted the attention of Mastertronic. Um, for those of you who were probably under twenty five years of age, <coughs> back in the day when we were young. Um, that's how your games came on a tape. You had to wait 20 minutes for it to load. And, uh, a lot of the tapes were probably cost about 10 or each, but Mastertronic were one of the earliest companies to sell them for two or three pounds each. So uh, they sold a lot of games at a very low price to make to make their money. So um, how did you end up working with Mastertronic and, and what were your sort of memories at that time? Um, well, we did a few games like this mail order, and then um, our dad joined the company as well. And um, he'd had, uh, he helped us get the games into like W.H. Smiths and Boots and some of the retailers. <coughs> and then Master Trunk set up, and that was Frank Herman and Martin Alpha and Alan Sharan. Um, they were from the video industry, so they'd been doing cheap videos, mm -hmm. and they thought they wanted to do like good value games as well. Yeah. But they didn't really know how to make games, but they saw our games in the shops, and they thought they'd contact us to, to develop the games. So then, we developed quite a few games from Mastertronic, and then after about a year, they did all of our games through us, and we set up a company called Artificial Intelligence Products, which had a contract to do all of their games. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also did some games for Robert Maxwell, which is a bit contentious. <laughs> <laughs> he had a games company called Mirosoft, um, and they discovered Tetris in Russia, and they did lots of things in quite a teenage mutant. So he's some quite high level stuff. But we did the games creative for them. Um, yeah, I, I put that on there. I was interested. Um, do you think this was the first example of a way for other people to create games? Was it what the, the first sort of like a, a package that other people could use to create their own games? Yeah. I don't I couldn't find any earlier record of such a product. I know we've got some of the homebrew coders in the in the crowd here that, that um, that may have used tools like that back in the early days when they were first learning. Yeah. Yeah, there might be some, I can't really remember if there was. Like, we developed it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then, because we, we used it to make our own games. Yeah. And then we thought we could sell it. So we yeah. uh, decided to sell it as well. Okay. So um, that's the sort of early days of these chaps before uh, Codemasters. Obviously, um, David and his brother were getting very successful at publishing their, their games and, and providing their games for another company. Um, so I, I guess the theory was you could probably make a bit more money by forming your own company and releasing them yourselves. Yeah. Which brings us on to Codemasters. Um, well, it was really with Master Tronic, the 
trouble was that we, they wanted us to do lots and lots of games in a very short period. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do fewer games that weren't really high quality. Yeah. So eventually we thought we're going to have to set up our own publishing company to enable us to do what we want to do. So we set up, so we sold our half of artificial intelligence products back to them. And then we used the money to set up Codemasters. And then we spent about eight months writing about six or eight games. I think the first one was BMX Simulator, that my brother Richard mostly wrote, and my friend James did the graphics. And that was our first game that we launched. And then we did, because that was really successful, we did lots of simulator games, like Grand Prix Simulator and then Pro Ski Simulator and all kinds of simulators. <laughs> Uh, so this is where Bruce comes back into the into the picture. Sorry to keep you quiet at the end there, but um, you, um, how did you get involved with with Codemasters? What well, obviously you uh, imagine it folded at this point, and you were obviously looking for other things to get involved with. So how did you? Well, I was actually by then in London, running a, a hardware company called Abbott, which was buying and selling stuff, and. I was reading the trade magazine called CTW, and one day I saw this very, very cheeky advert which, that was done in editorial style, and it was them starting up. And I thought, I like how they're doing things. So I got in touch with them, and went and saw them up in Banbury, and they said, oh yes, we can do with your skills here, come in two days a week. By the end of the month, I was full time. Obviously doing good work there. Uh... So what, were your, what was your main sort of role when you first joined the company? Was it marketing or...? Purely marketing. Yeah, yeah. But it was very difficult because the games were selling at one ninety nine each, so there wasn't much budget to spend. Mm -hmm. So you were really, you were really strapped. So what we did is, to reach the consumers, we used public relations. And we went to a company in London called Lynn Franks, which is what Absolutely Fabulous is based on. Right. And they got David and Richard onto the TV programs into the car supplements and all that sort of stuff. And then the main push for advertising was to get the prop into the trade. So we did lots of trade advertising in CTW. Uh, to, 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 to. And it, it worked. We, we, had a, a, we had a little trick. We, did, we had a, a subtext that we were selling full price games at budget prices. So then that killed both lots of our competitors off because People would say, well, why buy a full price game when I can get the same quality of budget price? And all our budget competitors killed them off because people were saying, well, why should I buy one of those games when I can get the full price game for the same price? Yeah. So it killed both lots of competitors off with one slogan. And within the first year's trading, we got up to over 27% of the total UK market. Quite an, quite an achievement. Um, obviously, you talked about the market in the I wanted to. Um, those of you that, that remember the Codemasters uh, packaging might remember. Um, this sort of stuff off the off the back <laughs> on, which was um, quite quite an interesting approach. Now, I don't I don't want to um, make too much of it, but there seems to be a lot of quotes from yourself, Dave, uh, uh, saying.